we have a similar dilemma that we all have to think about now, which is if we're going to be teaching remotely for a lot longer than we think, what things are going to be much better to do synchronously and what should we preserve for asynchronous? And so maybe it makes sense for us to all consider what our courses would look like if they were blended courses, hybrid courses, where they're partly online and partly in person. You're listening to Speaking of Language, a podcast recorded at the Language Resource Center at Cornell University. Each week, we explore a topic related to language pedagogy and second language acquisition. This week on Speaking of Language. Shannon Spasova, technology specialist in the Center for Language Teaching Advancement at Michigan State University and assistant professor of Russian, speaks with us about useful tools for teaching and learning language online. Welcome to a new episode of Speaking of Language. I'm Angelica Kramer, the director of the Language Resource Center at Cornell University. And I'm Sam Lupowitz, the LRC's media manager. Our special focus on language teaching and learning strategies in a virtual space continues today with our friend and colleague, Shannon Spasova. Shannon is a technology specialist in the Center for Language Teaching Advancement at Michigan State University and assistant professor of Russian. We will talk about useful tools for teaching and learning language online. Welcome to Speaking of Language, Shannon. Thanks. Thanks for having me. We are so delighted that you are taking the time out of your busy schedule with online teaching, with moderating about 4,897 Facebook groups, (laughs) um, with all of your work that you're doing for IELT, the International Association for Language Learning Technology. So before we talk about um, your favorite tools for teaching and learning language online, can you talk a little bit about your background? What do you do when you don't teach remotely? (laughs) Sure. So um, the first time I was using technology in my teaching was I was using interactive TV back in 1999. So this was uh, kind of the precursor of what we're doing now. But I had to go to a special building where they were two people helping me coordinate everything. <laughs> <laughs> so things were a little different back then. Yeah. Um, then I worked on curriculum development and I did coursework in instructional design. And now I focus mostly on hybrid language teaching. Mm-hmm. So when we think about these online tools, so right now everybody is scrambling. We just Um, are about a week, a little over a week into teaching in this new remote environment. And we've been ensuring that people know how to use Zoom and how to use the learning management system for us. That's Canvas. But what are some other tools and resources that can support language instruction? What are some of your favorites? Yeah, I'm going to talk maybe about three that are my favorites. Mm -hmm. Um, The first one I want to talk about is Flipgrid. Mm -hmm. And it's exciting that it's totally free. Oh, yeah, we Um, like that. Yeah, and if you already have um, Microsoft on your campus, like Microsoft 365, then it might even be integrated. Hmm, okay. Um, Because it was bought by Microsoft. So uh, Flipgrid is a tool that you can use for students to respond to things with their voice. So you can have them have a class discussion Uh, where maybe, for example, students have to ask each other questions and then respond to each other using video Mm -hmm. and audio. Um, Or you can do things like having speaking assessments or oral tests um, using Flipgrid. It just depends on your settings, whether you let students see each other's videos or whether it only goes to you. Mm. There are also some other fun things that are possible in Flipgrid. Like you can have students do sticky notes or stickers or drawings on top of their videos, which can be fun. Um, (laughs) Or dangerous. (laughs) Yeah. Um, So it depends on, you can set it so that they either can or can't do that. And I think it obviously depends on your goal. Um, Sure. uh, But I think my students have had fun doing that on occasion. Um, I read that they have a new thing now too, where you can, you may be able even to do screencasts with it. I haven't tried. Oh wow! That part okay, yet. Huh. that's cool. Uh, and it's a relatively easy tool to start out with, although the there are a lot of settings that you can customize once you kind of get the hang of it. Um, I made a, I called it an asynchronous webinar <laughs> for mm, IELTS nice. recently about how to use 
Flipgrid. So you can look for that on the FLT mag. Um, IELT has a lot of good resources for people to look to. Um, one is our webinars. We usually do them once a month, but we've done a few more recently. Um, and we've been posting our archives on the FLT mag, which is our online publication. So it's just fltmag.com. And so you can find a bunch of these resources there. And so this asynchronous webinar that I created, I posted it there on FLT mag. And I'm hoping that people will create their own videos as if they were students so that they can get the feel of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Another thing that's nice about Flipgrid is that it's very easy to use with mobile devices. Oh, nice. Okay. Even if your students don't have great computers or even that great of internet connectivity, I feel like it is usable if they have a smartphone. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, and of course, I mean, this is this is so important for language instruction because you can get students to simulate face-to-face conversations and um, they can just practice speaking skills and create little fun videos too. So adding yeah. a, little, a little bit of creativity um, and just lightening up the mood a little bit too. Yeah, and I feel like it can be used either for presentational mode or sort mm-hmm. of sort of interpersonal. I mean, it's still asynchronous, so it's not exactly the same as interpersonal, sure. but it can sort of come close mm-hmm. to that where they maybe ask each other questions. Yeah. No. And there as you also, mentioned, we like that it's free, right? That's... Mm-hmm. Oh, definitely. That's <laughs> one of the big pluses. Um, a couple other nice things are that you can uh, include a variety of things as your prompt. Huh. So it can be a video of you or it can be an image. And I find that useful sometimes. Like, I don't know, maybe you have a small map that you want them to um, Mm -hmm. use to give directions or who knows what it could be. Um, You can include videos, um, like other videos that you upload. Mm -hmm. And there are a variety of other things that you can include as your prompt. It also gives you some options, some good options for giving feedback. So you can give video feedback yourself to them. And then you can also build in a little rubric if you'd like. Yeah, that's nice. And I think it's good too, now that everything um, has shifted to this remote environment, I feel sometimes feedback tends to be written only now, but Mm -hmm. the fact that you can give spoken feedback, right, and, and provide more listening input for your students is really great. Yeah, and you can have it go exactly to what they just did. So it's not, it, it's still delayed in time, sure. but it's it's not delayed in at least they can identify what it is you're responding to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, nice. So Flipgrid is one of your favorite tools. What about the other one or the other two? <laughs> yeah, maybe uh, the second one I'll mention is called Padlet. Mm-hmm. And this one, I think, I guess I'm not too up to date on its uh, pricing. As far as I remember, um, you can maybe have five for free, if if I'm right. Uh, so what Padlet is, is it's kind of like a discussion board or a bulletin board, mm-hmm. and you can have students put anything up on it. Um, so you can have them put up their text. You can have their them put up their video. Um, you can have them put images on there. And so it's kind of like just a big bulletin board. You can, um, you can structure it if you want, or you can have it be kind of unstructured and chaotic. And again, that might depend <laughs> on, on your goal and your topic. Um, but one of the reasons I like this is because it's so flexible. You can do almost anything you want with it. It's just basically a way to, for students to be able to post different things. And again, they can respond to each other if that's what you want them to do. Um, and, and it is a tool that you can at least use at least partly for free. I, as the last time I remembered, it was that five that you could have for free, five of these bulletin boards. And what I like about that, I've used that in a, an asynchronous, fully online course that I that I taught. Um, just the visual aspect of having basically all of these virtual sticky notes. And as you said, depending on how the teacher sets it up, they can be like all over the place or they can come up as a stream um, and just allowing students to quickly respond to something or like one thing that I did because my class was completely asynchronous and students never were online at the same time or were even like dispersed all over the uh, all over the world 
um, we used that as a first platform to introduce ourselves so that we could kind of create community in our class. And um, the class was about fairy tales, so they had to um, post something about their favorite fairy tale. So related to the course topic still, but also just something visual, like a, a wall where they could see who everybody else in that class was. Yeah, and online, one of the challenges is keeping or creating that class community. Mm-hmm. And I think you're right that, that that aspect of creativity is really important for people being able to express themselves mm-hmm. in the online space. And so being able to do that creatively, both with Padlet, with the things that you post there, or Flipgrid, even those little sticky notes can sometimes, or stickers can sometimes give a little bit of personal flair to it. And I think that is important in this in this online space where it's a, in some ways a little harder to express yourself creatively. And I think also in in learning and beginning to speak a foreign language, um, it can be difficult to feel like you can express yourself. Mm, yeah, that's true. That is um, true. Because you've only, maybe you only know what you've been taught so far, or you're just starting to be able to use it creatively and put together new sentences. And so allowing them other ways or additional ways to express themselves, I think is really important. Mm-hmm. Yep. So now we've had one example of something that's more geared toward speaking and listening and then um, Padlet that's geared more toward, I mean, you can still upload videos too, but probably Mm -hmm. more text-based. What's the third tool? (laughs) I saved the best for last. Ah. (laughs) (laughs) My absolute favorite tool in the history of tools. And I try a lot of these. I try almost everything new. (laughs) Um, Is called H5P. And um, it's a it's a very varied tool, and I would say that this is whereas Flipgrid and Padlet are extremely easy to use, H five P is maybe a notch up in uh, learning curve. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's difficult to use, and I think when people see it, they may think it is because it looks really cool, and it may take a little bit more of investment to learn to use it, but I think it really pays off in spades. Um, number one, because it's such a cool tool, but number two, because when you use one of its activity types, you can learn to use all of the rest as well. So h5p.org, you can also use this for free. Um, it has a whole variety of tools. Um, I don't even know how many activity types they have now. I think it might be 50 or more. Oh, yeah. yeah, a lot. And so there are some that are more traditional, like multiple choice or fill in the blanks, but there are some that are a lot more um, interesting, like the one that I probably use the most is called interactive video. And it's, if you're familiar with something like PlayPosit or Edpuzzle, it's kind of like that, where Mm -hmm. you can have a video playing and then you can have little interactions that come up during the video. So can it be, it can be little captions or commentary, or it can be little quizzes. And um, part of the reason why I like H5Ps more than I like PlayPosit or Edpuzzles because there are a lot more choices and there are a lot more ways to give feedback, targeted feedback. Mm, mm -hmm. It has some really cool things. um, Like, for example, um, there are some parts of it that are slightly adaptive. And what I mean by that is, for example, you can have where what uh, students, if they get everything right in a quiz, it will allow them to jump to a certain place in the video. So I've done that on occasion where if a student gets the quiz all correct, then they can skip part of the next part. Um, You can also do things like Uh, according to what they do, it will skip to a part of the video according to a choice that they might make. So I haven't really even dipped my toe very much in this, Mm, Yeah, but I can imagine some really cool uses of that where you have students are able to make choices for a story, for example, sort of like a choose your Mm, own adventure, mm -hmm. Uh, and they can skip around depending on what their choices are. So it has some really cool extra things like that, but it also has everything you'd expect, like that you can input um, 
text or images that pop up at certain points. And so I find this really useful because, for example, um, if there's some kind of cultural knowledge that your students need in order to understand the video, you can have it kind of pop up and tell them about it, but not interrupt the flow of the video. So an example for this is um, in my class, I use uh, this cartoon. Some people may have seen it if they have kids. It's on Netflix in English now. It's called Masha and the Bear. Yeah. <laughs> Russian, Russian cartoon. Um, there's one episode of that where it's about the first day of school. And if you're listening, you hear in the background someone talking on the TV about the 1st of September. And that's always the first day of school in Russia. But if you don't know that, then you wouldn't have put two and two together that they're going to be showing something about the first day of school. And so yeah. I have that come up on the screen since students may not have that background knowledge yeah. to prepare them for the rest of the episode. I have that come up on the screen so that they see that. Another example is that uh, in that same episode, Masha uses the little girl. She uses a notebook that's a very typical type in Russia. And so I get a picture of one of those and I put it up to show them what it looks like. Mm, I see. A whole bunch of ways you can kind of bring in cultural content without it sort of interrupting the flow so much that you can't enjoy the video itself. Um, So interactive video, that's um, probably my favorite of the H5P Uh activity types. But there are so many, and I can tell you about a few of them. Um, Well, another one I like a lot is course presentation. And it's basically like a slideshow, sort of like a PowerPoint, but it incorporates interactive activities. Um, It also has, again, ways that you can skip around. So, Mm -hmm. for example, that asynchronous webinar that I mentioned that I created for Flipgrid, I made using the H5P course presentation. And I uh, made different sections of it. And one of them said, if you want to make a Flipgrid for a class discussion, go to this slide. If you want to make a Flipgrid for an oral assessment, go to this slide. Hmm. And it let you skip around according to your choice. Nice. Um, Those two are the activity types that I use the most, interactive video and course presentation. But there are a bunch of other cool ones. Um, One that I've started to use a little bit is called Speak the Words. And what it does is it uses Google's speech recognition uh, technology. And you can put in what you want students to say, and then it will try to... try to guess whether they've said it or not. It will listen to what they've said and it will assess whether they have said that or not. So obviously you can only do it with, um, you can't do it with open-ended stuff. You can't Mm. do it with like personalized stuff. But if you have something that's sort of discreet, a discreet item that they're going to pronounce, then they can pronounce it and it will tell them whether they've said it right. And obviously you cannot do this with high stakes things because it's perfect Um, And I I think that it's important to tell your students that it's not perfect. But one of the things it has that I like is that it has a thing where if it thinks you said it wrong, it will have a button that says show solution. And if you click that, then it will show you what it thinks you said, which could be useful, I think. Mm -hmm. Because I think um, we all have had students who... um, have difficulty with pronunciation, like maybe they tend to miss the syllables or things mm-hmm. like that, um, and are have a hard time hearing it themselves. This could be a way that they could identify some of those issues without the embarrassment. And I, I, I don't want people to think they should be embarrassed in class if they mispronounce things, but sometimes they are anyway. Sure, sure. Um, and so... They, I've used it with my students and they have said that it was nice to have a way for them to get some feedback on their pronunciation mm-hmm. but without feeling embarrassed about mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. And so that's another uh, cool um, activity type that I've used from H5P. Another one is called, uh, oh, this one's interesting and I haven't quite decided um, whether it's, it's a good one, but I think in certain situations it could be, it's called essay. 
Okay. But it's not exactly an essay. Um, so what it does is it has, you can put a, a prompt or a question and then students are supposed to put in an answer. Mm-hmm. Obviously it can't check the answer a hundred percent, but what it does is it checks for keywords. Okay. So I think if you were looking for specific things, um, it could be useful as a, um, you know, automatic feedback. Um, mm, mm-hmm. So an example that I've tried it with is, let's say your students have read a text about uh, St. Petersburg. Um, and you ask them to um, identify three famous sites from St. Petersburg. Um, you can put in those things in the background of H5P as accepted answers, and you can give it um, alternative spellings and alternative mm, wordings. Mm-hmm. Nice. Um, and so, again, it can't, like, speak the words. It, it's not perfect, and it can't do something that's personalized. Like, it wouldn't be able to understand what you wrote about your own family or something like that. But if it's specific answers that you're looking for, and if you're able to put in um, alternative answers, then it can check somewhat automatically huh. for those elements and give students feedback mm-hmm. without even you having to look at it. Yeah. Well, that's nice. And that makes it easier for the teacher too, right? At, at least if there is a first line of defense where there is um, immediate automatic feedback and then um, the teacher could always later on in a different environment provide more detailed feedback as well. Yeah. Um, so many other activity <laughs> types that they have. Um, and yeah, some of the ones that they have that are more traditional, I even like more than most other tools. And part of the reason for that is because of the way they can, they give feedback. Mm-hmm. They yeah. allow you to, for example, they, in some of the activity types, they allow you to accept minor spelling mistakes, which mm. I think can be useful. And they also allow you to give very targeted feedback. So, for example, if you're giving, um, say, a fill-in-the-blank activity and there's a question that you know uh, what the common wrong answer might be, Uh right, you can put in specific feedback for that specific Uh wrong answer. Oh, wow. And so one of the things for online teaching that we've seen is that if students get things wrong, but don't know why that can be very frustrating. Yeah. But if you're able to give them good feedback and especially in this automatic way that gives them feedback right away, that can be especially useful. We are all have had situations where student has done homework and has made the same mistakes, the same mistake 10 times in a row. Yeah. And then they don't get it back for two days or whatever uh-huh, uh-huh. takes you that long to grade their homework. Well, this is one way maybe to avoid some of that because it can give uh, the feedback right away and it can give them that targeted feedback that can maybe help them explain for themselves, be a little more independent mm-hmm. um, and explain for themselves why they've made that mistake or how, what they need to do to fix it. And in, uh, now that we're, immersed in remote instruction across the country and across the globe, what are some things we should be thinking about or maybe watching out for or preparing for? Yeah. So I think that, you know, none of us know when this is going to end. And um, a lot of us have been told to try to prepare for summer and or maybe even fall Mm -hmm. being remote instruction as well. And I think one of the things we need to think about is, you know, right now we're coping as best we can because we had no notice or very little notice. We had two hours notice on our campus for going to remote teaching. So crazy. I mean, you know, luckily for me, I already had a lot of uh, yeah. of my course online because I teach hybrid courses. Um, but I think we all need to do what I had done for my course earlier for future courses, which is think about uh, what we want and how, what would work best in what, uh, type of situation. So I was thinking what will work well online and what should I preserve in face to face? Mm -hmm. And I think we have a similar dilemma that we all have to think about now, which is if we're going to be teaching remotely for a lot longer than we think, 
what things are going to be much better to do synchronously and what should we preserve for asynchronous? I, yep. I know a lot of people are trying to minimize the synchronous time that they're having with their students because some of them may have, you know, family issues that they're dealing mm-hmm. with, or some of them may have not very good internet at home. Mm-hmm. And I do think that's a legitimate concern that we should think about. Can we put as much asynchronously as makes sense? Um, and then preserve synchronous time for things that are less easy to do asynchronously. And so I think that that's one of the things that we should be thinking about for the future. And so maybe it makes sense for us to all consider um, what our courses would look like if they were blended courses, hybrid courses, Mm -hmm. where they're partly online and partly in person, and what our courses would look like if we were trying to limit our synchronous time with our students. Well, Shannon, thank you so much for sharing all of these wonderful resources and ideas and for giving our listeners um, really a roadmap to where they can find out more um, by simply going to FLT Mag. Um, Before we sign off, can you please share with us your favorite word in a language that you speak or are learning, have learned, or want to learn? (laughs) Sure. Well, Okay, this isn't exactly my favorite word because I couldn't think of what my favorite word was. But I thought of a word that is, to me, symbolic of the, one of the things I like about Russian. Mm-hmm. Okay, so this word is achividna, which means obviously. Huh. And the reason I, I chose this word is because I like how Russian is one of those languages where if you know the roots you can pick them apart and understand words very easily. Mm -hmm. So the word, so achi vidna, ochi are eyes and vid is to see. So something that obviously is something that's, that you can see with your eyes. And so I really love teaching the class that I teach second year Russian because they're getting to the point where they know enough of these roots that they can start to put them together and understand words that they've never seen before. And so that word is, symbolic of that ability once you have those roots in Russian that you can easily understand obviously you can obviously understand new words if you know the roots achievedna it's awesome very cool well thanks so much for speaking of language with us today Shannon you're welcome thanks for having me Tune in again next week when our special focus on language teaching and learning strategies in a virtual space continues. Until then, auf Wiederhören! The Language Resource Center is located on the ground floor of Stimson Hall on Cornell's main campus in Ithaca, New York. Check us out on the web at lrc.cornell.edu or look for Cornell LRC on Facebook and Twitter. Speaking of Language is produced by Angelica Kramer and Sam Lupowitz. Recorded by Sam Lupowitz. Original music by Sam Lupowitz, Dan Gable, and Joe Gibson. Thanks also to the College of Arts and Sciences at Cornell University. As a reminder, the ideas and opinions expressed on this podcast do not reflect those of the College of Arts and Sciences or any other official entity of Cornell University. We thank our listeners and do stay tuned for our next episode.